This is Worship God, a podcast of the Gospel Coalition Canada. Worship God is designed to equip worshipers and worship leaders for Christ-centered worship. Well, welcome back to Worship God, a TGC Canada podcast about all things worship. My name is Rob Brockman. I'm an associate pastor at Cornerstone Baptist Church in Aurelia, Ontario. And today I am joined by my good friend and the lead pastor of South Shore Bible Church in Barrie, Ontario, Jody Cross. Jody, good to see you, brother. Rob, it's good to see you too. And um, it's good to be back here again. Um, yeah. I'm, I don't know about you, but I'm enjoying spring. And Yes. Uh, I'm not sure when folks will be listening to this, but uh, the snow has melted where we live and uh, we can get outside again. And it's, yeah. you know, it's, isn't it good just to have a new season like spring and post Easter is a great season. It's a good season for the church. It's a good season for our souls. Are you feeling yeah. that way too? Oh, totally. And we even had like a bit of a, um, like a summer week <laughs> for at the time of recording this, we had like last week was glorious weather it was like almost 30 you know it was beautiful and then this week it kind of snowed again <laughs> i know record breaking actually it felt like the middle of middle of july it was pretty pretty phenomenal and i don't yeah. know about you but uh, speaking of post easter do you do you feel like you you need a bit of a holiday after you get through the the holy week services oh, yeah. you feeling the, that drain there is definitely a, a, a sense of Easter is such a high that, 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 that weekend, Good Friday, Easter, it's just a, it's an emotional high because you're considering things that are so deeply profound and life-changing that you kind of need to like, yeah, hollow out your week a bit after Easter if you're working uh-huh. in ministry and just kind of pull back and just take a break. And it's nice to have a break because you get to just go, man, like that was a lot. There was a lot of reflection there. And, and, and often for people like us in ministry, it, it is, you kind of breeze through it. We don't, I don't know. I don't know how you feel, Jody, but sometimes I don't feel I really get to sink in it in the moment because I'm working like, and I'm trying to plan things. And sometimes I need like a day or two afterwards just to go, yeah, let's just consider. Let me now take my time to consider what we just spent the whole weekend Mm -hmm. focusing on. Yeah, I agree. My considering was coming home on Sunday, grabbing lunch and then loading up the family and driving two and a half hours to a family right. <laughs> dinner only to arrive home at 11 o'clock Sunday. Oh, yeah. So my, my considered time evaporated on the highway and uh, <laughs> I, we should probably do a, we should probably do an episode sometimes on recovering from the big seasons. Yeah. You know, the totally. cr- Christmas, I think Christmas, September, Easter season and what that does to us as leaders. And uh, yeah, maybe we can do that sometime. We'll just, we'll talk through some of that stuff. Oh, totally. It's kind of um, after, after that season, there's like a bit of sometimes even like an emotional like drop where you just feel kind of like, boom, a little, little, little like Eeyore. (laughs) I think I'm, I think I'd like to go on a cruise right now for, yeah, that's it. Yeah. Well, you know, many of us spend extra time and energy, like you're saying, Jody, in this season and not only with in ministry, but just like you were saying, even with our families. And so taking a bit of time off for recovery is a wise thing. And speaking of time off, uh, segue, uh, that's kind of what we wanted to talk about today in a way. For for all of us, there are Sundays where we aren't leading the congregation from the front and we aren't really serving in any way. And uh, we thought it would be good to talk a little bit about how as worship leaders, we're still leading even though we're not necessarily up front. And, you know, for our listeners, perhaps you haven't thought about this before, but, you know, if you're serving in the worship ministry and whether you're on sound or you're a drummer or a bass player or you're leading worship um, or you're the preacher, um, you're still leading when you're not serving that week. People look to you still and we can have a powerful influence on the weeks that we are just part of the congregation. Um, we can have as powerful of his influence as the weeks that we're serving up front. And, and so Jody, I don't know about you, but for me, after being in the full-time ministry for, you know, 15 years now, it's pretty rare that I get a Sunday just to be in the congregation. And I find it a little uncomfortable 
What about mm-hmm. you? Are are you comfortable those weeks when you're you're in bliss, kind of when you're mm-hmm. not up front preaching or leading worship, or has it gotten to the point now where it kind of feels like, wow, this feels weird? Yeah, it doesn't happen very often. I think it happens on holiday weeks more than anything. You know, mm. When either I'm at my home church or whether I'm visiting, yeah. and I, I guess I agree with you that sometimes it it just feels a little bit. Um, it, it feels like I'm a visitor in a sense because I'm so used to arriving at quarter to eight in the morning, not at quarter to ten in the morning, and it it, it feels like you're a visitor. You're experiencing something that everybody else experiences. Yeah, and it's a very different. And and if you're at a different church, of course you're you're going to be slightly um, off balance a little bit because it's a whole new thing. So, but you know, so there, there's, there's that thing for people who are in full-time ministry and who don't get a lot of Sundays off a year. But if you, as you said, if you're on a team as a drummer and you're on a three week rotation, then two out of those three weeks, you're actually off the platform yeah, two thirds of the time. And I think mm-hmm. both both scenarios, whether you're on a on a more infrequent rotation or whether you're on 99% of the time, I think what we're going to talk about um, is going to be helpful. And um, I I actually love when I have the opportunity just to sit and to be and to not be on. Mm-hmm. And I think when you are not handling the details, uh, you know, and you're not concerned about making sure everything goes the way you hope it goes, then you can just receive from the Lord in a way that's different than when you're either preaching or uh, leading worship or, you know, in the rare, rare case, uh, sometimes I would say probably three times a year, I'm actually doing both. I'm leading worship and preaching on a Sunday. Just talk about a, right. you know, talk about a full, yeah. kind of full, a full brain, but uh, yeah, yeah. So I think it's, this is a great topic. Yeah. I, w- I was thinking I can, I considered this cause the other week I was, was one of those where rare weeks where I was just, in the audience during worship. Now that was because I was preaching, (laughs) but, um, I was there being able to, being able to, being uh, able to sit with my wife for once, you know, during Mm -hmm. worship. And I was looking around and kind of noticing other worship team members in the crowd and what they were doing. And it got me thinking about this, this topic. And, and maybe for some of you, you're thinking, Rob, why is this important? Like, why does it matter to discuss this? And I think there's a couple things, um, one thing for me, a reason that I think this conversation is important is because we can run the danger potentially of, of appearing to be disingenuous or maybe even worse, hypocritical if we are one way on stage and then another in the congregation. Um, you know, people trust authenticity. Part of what makes a leader trustworthy is that we're genuine we're real we walk the walk talk the walk or walk the talk you know and and i was thinking about david like day so we in the story of david david is anointed king by samuel god had rejected saul um samuel comes and anoints david and it's a while before david takes the kingship you know and so he just continued to be faithful. He continued to faithfully shepherd. And when we get to the story of Goliath, David's still in the fields shepherding and he's still being faithful, you know, quote unquote off stage. And so I think the risk is we can appear to be disingenuous. We can appear to be um, hypocritical if we're one way on stage and one way off stage. Jody, why do you think maybe it's important that we still view ourselves as worship leaders, even when we're not up front? You know, by the by the fact of our position, we are we are always on for worship, never off. We might not be on for leadership, but we're always on for worship. Mm. And so we are, uh, you know, people are watching us for sure. But I, I love the um, I love the idea that being a lead worshiper isn't um, something that we just do. It's who we are. I like to say that, you know, if, when you're a dad or a mom, you don't, you don't stop being a dad and, mm. you know, whether you're with your kids or not. So in the same way with worship, whether, whether you're leading worship or you're worshiping, you're still a worshiper regardless of where you are. And so it's not a job. It's not just what we do. And, uh, scripture says in Psalm 34, I will bless the Lord at all times. Actually, I, I love this verse because because it actually talks about leading or it actually gives us it gives us help for when when we're 
we are a leader, but we're not officially leading. I will bless the Lord at all times. Uh, and that's kind of on and off the platform, which is why I like it. His praise will continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. And then this call to other people, oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt mm-hmm. his name together. And there is a sense that we are leading because we're worshipers and because we are doing what Psalm 34 says, we're calling out to each other through our own example, through our own position of leadership, through the fact that we're just a worshiper, that we're saying, hey, let's let's do this together. I'm going to do this right now, and I want you to do do this with yeah. me. Yeah. Well, and I think even like it reveals the authenticity, I mean, the um, validity of our theology of worship, because if we, we view leading worship and being a worship leader as just something I do up front with a guitar, uh, that speaks a bit to, or on the piano or whatever we're doing, or whether it's I'm playing bass or playing drums, like, oh, I'm leading worship only when I'm playing an instrument. Again, that reveals a little something about our theology of worship. Worship Mm -hmm. is our entire lives. Mm -hmm. Worship is everything we do. And so in that sense, the way that we live as people, the way that we um, are parents, the way that we are husbands and wives, the way that we are friends, everything reveals a life that is, as Romans 12 talks about, given to God fully kind of on the altar as worship, our entire lives. And so you're right, there's a consistency there that needs to happen. There's a, there's a, there's a transparency and there's a, there's a sense in which people need to look at us on stage and look at us off stage and go, yeah, Jody's the same guy. Like Jody is the same guy on stage when he leads worship as when he stands next to me. And he's always there. He's always serving. He's always got a smile. He's always being, giving Jesus all that he has. And I think that that, that example is what our people need um, profoundly. So, Mm -hmm. so, so Jody, in terms of how worship leaders can still lead worship, even when they're off stage, I think it'd be good to get kind of practical and, and give our people some ways to consider how they can still lead worship when they're off off stage that week. So mm. what would you say is something that our people can reflect on uh, in terms of how they can lead, even though they're not mm-hmm. on stage that week? Yeah. Yeah. Um, being committed to the local church and coming, mm. come, you know, if, if people just show up when they're scheduled and that's it, then it leaves you with a sense that you're not really committed to the community. You're committed to your role mm. and, you as a worship leader as a worship musician and a team you're part of a community you're part of a body that you're your family and so whether you're singing or not uh, particularly scheduled you are still committed to this family and still committed to encouraging others and still committed to worshiping god and so people uh you know come and stay committed to um, not attending church only when you're on but be consistent your commitment to uh, to encourage people and um, people will be looking to us. There's a you know there is a a calling of God. Leadership is a calling, and it's with that comes a, an authority piece. It also comes a responsibility, and it also comes with a platform. Hmm. And I'm just reminded that people watch us all the time. You know, they notice things. I mean, some people have the gift of noticing, and but I think leaders are watched. I remember there was uh, somebody that I, I knew a number of years ago and um, was a lead pastor. And when I was up leading the singing part of the service, um, this individual was uh, reading his sermon notes and looking at his watch and hmm. in a sense, quite oblivious to, um, you know, just, just what was going on. So uh, we, we want to come and uh, we want to make sure that as people are looking at us, they're seeing that our, that our example is an encouraging one. It's often something that um, I think we need to remind people on our team about is that it's because it's an easy habit. We can fall into coming, only coming to church when we're on. And I think we don't reflect upon what example um, does that actually set for our church. Something else that I think on kind of related to that is, I think as a worship leader, it's important that whether we're on worship or not, 
We're coming to church on time. Mm -hmm. We're we're there. We're ready to worship. After all, we know. <laughs> the sad thing is, like as worship leaders, we know how the challenge it can be to lead to lead our church in worship when they haven't come ready, when they're not coming on time. It's halfway through the first song and people are still showing up and we're on stage going, oh. we know the, the decibel level of voices before the sermon versus after the sermon is different because you know the whole church is there mm. by the time the sermon hits. And so, but then yet we fall into those bad habits too. We can't even get ourselves to the place where we're coming to church on time when we're not on worship. And so I definitely think that that is something that will really help. Um, just the, um, yeah, the example that we set as well, like coming to church early is a great opportunity to, to fellowship, to encourage one another, to address one another in Psalms and hymns and spiritual Psalms, which is part of corporate fellowship and worship. And so coming on time, getting to hang out with a little old lady who's there 20 minutes beforehand and just mm -hmm. ministering to her and talking to her and fellowshipping with some of the youth after church and, and discussing how their lives are going. That is all part mm. of mm. the corporate worship. You know, I used to get a lot irritated when it was like, ah, oh, people are chatting, you know, when I'm trying to call, do the call to worship. But you know what? Like, that's part of worship. Part of worship is fellowship. Part of worship is coming together and speaking God's word and saying hi to one another. And so we want to make sure that we're prioritizing fellowship. And sometimes what can happen is as musicians, because we're uncomfortable as worship leaders, we were really only comfortable on stage. We're not good at the before and after of church. So we'll come to church a bit late and we'll, as soon as the mm -hmm. worship's done, we're out the door. And I also think that that can be a bad example hmm. um, for our people. And so tr tr make sure you're coming on time. Make sure you're fellowshipping. Make, mm -hmm. you, make sure that you're modeling what you would like to see from your people as well would be mm -hmm. another thing. Yeah, inspire people with your example. And yeah, I, I think we've said before in one of the podcasts that we're not just we're not just beings that make music. We're relational beings that that need to love people. We need to love people more than we we love what we do and mm -hmm. your ability to be trusted and followed back to what you're saying earlier about not appearing to be hypocritical is that that people get to know us you know you just imagine if if your lead pastor showed up at uh, 30 seconds before he was about to preach and then uh, was let out a door and you never knew who he was that yeah. <laughs> there's a sense that he lives in a different world than you do and uh, while he might have some good things to say the relational piece, it just doesn't exist. As opposed mm -hmm. to someone, I visited a church a number of years ago in the States and the lead pastor at a very large church said, if you're new here, um, 20 minutes after the service is done, I'm going to be in the back corner of the foyer and I would love to meet all our guests. And there was, I think, 20 people that lined up and he stayed there and talked and had, you know, conversations. And it's like, wow, this guy is really prioritizing people. And mm. I think that's uh, something that happens when we get there early as when we're not on because we get to build those relationships with people. And um, another one I was thinking of was uh, you just said model what you want the church to do. And, um, you know, so that's, that's important. Another one would just be the real obvious one. How do you lead when you're not leading is worship. And <laughs> so you, you determine that that you're going to come to um, draw near to God, as the scripture says in James, and he will draw near to you. And for us to get our eyes on Jesus and mm. to fix our heart on him and to remember the gospel. And then there are things that we need to tune out, are the distractions. And, and maybe one of the distractions is that you wonder if people are watching you. And mm. you know, I don't know if you ever felt that, but you think, how demonstrative should I be? Um, <laughs> But I think that that worship response needs to be authentic from us, and we need to authentically engage with God, and we need to pray and say, "Lord, I'm I'm here to give you my best, and I also need to receive from you." And um, just to ask God to show you, uh, you know, His sufficiency for you in Christ. And worship is contagious. There, hmm. I think that's really what Colossians chapter three and Ephesians chapter five is saying that. Yeah. that our, our example is, um, is contagious and yeah. it's encouraging to each other as, as we are engaged, as we watch people who are serious about what they're saying, 
serious about what they're praying, serious about being there and drawing near to Christ and lifting him up in song, that that will, yeah. that will be um, something that catches like a fire. You mentioned being demonstrative and it, this is interesting because uh, the other week I mentioned, I was just sitting in church and um, I was preaching. So I got to, I had to be part of just the congregation in the singing time. And I remember having that thought like, yeah, people are watching me, but then realizing that, okay, I not, need to not think about that too much. So I need to lead, but I not to be, I need, I need to not let that prevent mm-hmm. me from knowing that I'm leading, prevent me from leading. Mm-hmm. And then I started like getting all like, I felt like I wasn't as free as I normally was on stage. And when I'm on stage, I feel like when I'm leading worship is what I mean for those of you who are getting kind of hung up on my language. When mm-hmm. I mean on stage, I just mean when I'm leading worship, I'm a lot more demonstrative, a lot more passionate. And then I felt like I was just kind of standing there with my arms folded in the service. And I was like, man, this is weird. And I'm sitting there and I'm kind of being critical, like, oh man, no, oh, the lyrics are a little slow. And and then I was just thinking like, man, what a bad congregant I'm being. <laughs> like if my poor worship leader is looking out and seeing mm. Pastor Rob, the worship leader mm. kind of with his arms folded mm. and kind of, you know, squ- mm. you know, squinting at the screen. And then it was just kind of convicting because it's like, no, like I should be the most obedient you know, mm-hmm. yeah. to the scriptures leader out here because I'm the one preaching it all the time. So I should be raising my hands. I should be clapping. I should be shouting. I should be, you know, falling, following what the worship leader says, you know? And so I was just something that I kind of went, man, like it's so easy to fall into that. Mm-hmm. And what's always encouraging um, to the worship leader is looking out and seeing their team, people who are on team with them yeah. being leaders out there. You know, exactly. when I look out and I see my other worship leaders praising the Lord, we have this one lady in our church who's one of our camera operators and she'll sit up in the balcony and I will often see her and she just blessing the Lord, like raising her hands, joy on her face. One of the most like demonstrative people in the church. And I just love it. It always encourages me that she is leading, you know, behind the scenes and leading in the crowd. And that's something where I think, man, I'm always encouraged by that example when I'm leading. Cause I'm like, mm-hmm. right. You know, yeah. she's responding, she's engaging. Mm-hmm. And so th- being demonstrative, clapping our hands when the worship leader says clap, mm-hmm. clap on beat, you know, doing those things, I think is a huge help to, to your worship leader. <laughs> clap on beat. I love that. Be, be the one who helps set the rhythm when other people are having that's trouble it. finding two and four, everyone two and four. <laughs> I think one of the the challenges for us is when we are in the congregation and we're not officially leading, it's to make sure that we're not being the critic of the service. Hmm. We tend to notice everything because we've been doing this. And so one of the ways that we'll actually, I think, hinder ourselves from worship is actually to be engaged in the service as the critic, as the evaluator. What was good? Hmm. What was bad? What did we like? What didn't we like? What went well? What didn't go well? And, you know, that completely stops us from actually engaging very well. And we need to, we need to, we will come with those eyes because if we have been entrusted with leadership, we notice everything. Mm-hmm. But we need to park that and engage, engage with God with what has been presented to us, the songs and the scriptures and the prayers. And, um, you know, we're still going to notice things. And I think there are things we can learn when we're on that side of the platform, but that we press through that stuff and say, you know, I'm, I'm here to actually meet with the Lord and to engage my heart, not to actually sit and crit- critique the team and the leader. Mm-hmm. Um, and, um, you know, present a checklist at the end of the service because that, that will definitely be uh, an issue. And, uh, I was just thinking as you're talking a minute ago as well, that even where we sit, I think is important. Hmm. If we're, if we're in the back corner of the balcony, that's it's kind mm-hmm. of the you know or the back back row of the auditorium where where that happens to be because we slipped in late. There's, I think we're missing out on the opportunity at as being um, a model. You talked about that a minute ago, yeah. an exemplary. And I think, you know, if you sit in the front row or the second row when you're when you're leading, well, even when you're not on that week, sit in the same spot. Let people watch you. Let people see mm-hmm. them. Let people see you. Um, with your eyes closed and with your Bible open and with your hands mm-hmm. raised. And because they want to know, 
they want to know that it's real uh, in the pew as much as it is on the platform for you. And you know, there's something there, Jody. Sit in the service. Sit in the service during the sermon. Um, you know, this is something that's been more recent, and this won't be every church, but it, for bigger churches, what, what can happen, especially churches that have green rooms. Maybe um, talk about that. that. Talk about that a little bit. What do you mean by a green room? Yeah, like- a green room A green room is, a, maybe a lot of our listeners won't know what a green room is because they've got a you know 80-person church, but a green room is essentially a place for the worship team to prepare, to go, um, and kind of hang out Often it's during while the service is happening because they have, they're doing multiple services. Mm-hmm. And so they need a place to go and not be distracting. And so they can go and they can chat. There's some refreshments because they're serving for, you know, six services over the weekend. And so what often happens is a, is a worship team can vanish during the sermon. Now our congregants need to understand that. Yeah. Sometimes it's because that worship person has been serving mm-hmm. since Saturday night and they've sat through this sermon twice already, mm. and you know, okay, they can't sit through it five times. So as a congregant, we need to understand sometimes why our worship team isn't in the service. Mm-hmm. But a lot of the time, I just see worship people just leave and go and hang out in the foyer, mm. and they just go and they go to the green room, and they don't need to. Yeah. They don't actually need to, and they're never sitting in and hearing the word of God preached, they never have their Bible open, like you just said. Mm-hmm. They, they're they never seen writing notes and studying the scriptures with the rest of the church. And I think that too mm-hmm. can be a problem. I was at a conference recently and somebody came up to me and I was leading worship there and somebody came up to me and made that comment to me. They said, hey, thank you for sitting in the service. They're like, you know, I never see worship members like Mm. sitting in the service, something like that. And again, I don't know the background of this guy's church. Maybe it's one of these churches where there's five services and instead of criticizing his, the worship members there, he needs to go and say, thank you because they're serving a lot. But I think the sentiment there is, Hey, worship leaders, sit in the service if you can. Like if you're not, unless you're doing five services and there's no reason, then you can't be in every service, but make sure that you are sitting under the preaching of the word. That is important. We need to be fed. We need to be mm-hmm. instructed and we need to see, our people need to see us in that humble posture, sitting there and being taught. Yeah, and we, I think we've said this, but people are watching us all the time. And if, if you're hired, particularly if you're on staff as a hired worship director, worship leader, music director, people are watching you and, you know, the Lord's watching us. Mm-hmm. And so we are setting some kind of an example, one that's going to either reinforce that God is worthy of all the praise or that, hey, this is just a music gig and whatever it happens to be, we're, we're communicating a message and pointing people either to the reality of God's worthiness that we should love him with, <clears throat> with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, or that music is great, man. And let's just sing some good music because they're mm-hmm. very different messages. Oh yeah. And uh, what a, what a great responsibility to, to be leaders when we're off. And I was thinking one more for, for a, a leader who's sitting in the, in the uh, congregation and worshiping and leading from, from that position as we've been talking about, I think one opportunity we have, particularly if, if you're the, let's say you're the worship pastor and one of your younger leaders is leading for, for whatever reason on a Sunday. And I don't know if you've ever felt this, Rob, but have you ever led worship where there was a f- somewhat renowned, you know, uh, someone you respected as a guest teacher? Uh, you know, I've, I've had that a, f- a few times where I've led at a conference and it's like, hey, that guy who just wrote all those books, who's known all over the United States, he's sitting in the front row and I'm about to sing four songs. <laughs> Yeah. And, you know, so I don't know if you've ever felt that where you feel there's this intimidation factor. And that can be the way if one of our younger leaders is leading and we're in the second row and they're thinking, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, 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 I'm kind of nervous. But so right. here's the opportunity we have to lead, to go up to the team, to go up to the that leader after the service and just encourage them and thank them and affirm mm-hmm. uh, them for what they did and how they served us and how they, they led us well. And just build them up because 
I think that's just a great thing that's saying, hey, I am for you. I wasn't here to judge you. I wasn't here to evaluate you. I was here to worship and sit under your leadership. Thank you for your gifting. And yeah. I would also add that uh, just as a plug, and probably there's going to be an amen for people listening, but generally it's been my experience that worship leaders, worship pastors, pastors, musicians don't receive a lot of encouragement and feedback. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think there's not a ton of affirmation and, and that goes a long way. So if you are a leader and you can encourage younger leaders, or if you're listening and, and you're not on the team a lot, then allow God to use you to affirm and encourage the people that serve you and, and prepare and, and work hard to to um, help facilitate this worship experience. And, and you know, Jody, to wrap up, I think I think the result of this, there's I think there's a lot of results that we could maybe think of. I think one result, what happens when we do this? What happens when we lead well? I think one key thing is that um, you begin to influence people around you. You begin to gain credibility in your congregation. You begin to gain credibility on your team Mm -hmm. and people will follow people will trust you and people will see that. Oh yeah. You're the same guy on and off stage. You're the same gal on and off stage. Uh, you're hungry for God's word. You're hungry to worship. Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter what you're doing. You're hungry for the Lord. And there's a sense in when, in which that, yeah, when we know that somebody is leading us in worship and they're the real deal, Mm -hmm. they're genuine. They love the Lord. They love Jesus. And they demonstrate that not only on stage, but off stage. We, you know, it's easy to be led in worship by somebody like that. Mm-hmm. It's just, man, you just want to follow. Mm-hmm. And so I would say that's one thing. What one might be another result in your mind, Jody, of leading this way mm. on and off stage? Yeah, we, we please the Lord that, mm. you know, that the Lord is discerning as much as people may be watching us. The Lord is discerning our thoughts and our actions and our motives. And it's not... Matthew chapter 15 talks about it. It's not just lip service. It's not just honoring him with, with our lips. It's, it's hearts that are not far from him, but that are very much connected to him. And I totally think what you've said is, is bang on, tr- building trust with the congregation, setting an example, and then pleasing the Lord, uh, the, who's the audience mm-hmm. of one he's watching. And, um, you know, I love that we can worship the Lord and please the Lord just by recapping all the things that we've said. We come early we prepare mm. ourselves, we sit, we engage, we encourage, and the Lord is discerning all of that. And all of those things are in of themselves an act of worship unto the Lord, as well as this, the spillover effects on horizontally to the people. And and he's the, the one that we aim to please. So it's a great thing. You know, I, I just, it's not just when I sing, when I play my guitar, that I can worship Jesus. It's all of these other things. And, um, and even even I'm pleasing the Lord as I'm trying to set a good example and uh, be someone, you know, the apostle Paul says in uh, first Corinthians 11, uh, imitate me as I, as I follow Christ. Mm. And, and we are just attempting to set the kind of example. It says, um, do as I'm doing, not because, you know, I've arrived, but because I'm pursuing Christ in this, this manner, in this worship service. And I want you to pursue Christ with me. And I want yeah. us back to Psalm 34. I, I want us together to exalt the Lord. And uh, he gets the glory and, and we just get the privilege of being part of it. Yeah. You know, I think we don't, we, the whole point of this is we don't want to be guilty of what Jesus said was true of the Pharisees when he said, this people honors me with their lips, but mm-hmm. their heart is far from me in vain. Do they worship me? Yeah. We uh, true worship, true. The worship that God is looking for is spirit uh-huh. and in truth. It's genuine. It is, it is not only lip service, it is heart uh-huh. service. And so that's what we're after. And so we pray that this episode has been helpful uh, to you as a listener for that. And we pray it's been an encouragement. So thank you for joining us on this episode, Jody. Thank you as well Thanks, for Rob. jumping on and we'll see you on the next episode of the worship God podcast. Bye for now. Worship God is a production of the Gospel Coalition Canada. For more Christ-exalting resources, go to ca.thegospelcoalition.org.